All right, students, welcome back, and we are going to get continue with Chapter 11. We're talking about California during World War II, and in this um, section, we're actually going to get into California in the post-war years. So we're going to begin by talking about daily life during the war, and a lot of the things that we'll be talking about in this particular example will apply not just to uh, California, but also to the United States generally. Life for uh, people living in the United States during World War II changed dramatically because World War II was a war in which total war was implemented, meaning that all of the nation's resources, manpower, everything was um, focused on the war effort. California will be particularly impacted by it because of its proximity to the Pacific. So we'll talk more about that. Um, we're also gonna talk about entertainment during the war, which is something that we don't often think of when we think of wartime, but certainly during World War II in particular, we're starting to see the emergence of the big band era, the dance halls and things like that that are gonna emerge on the landscape and become very important for the young people growing up in wartime America. Then we're gonna talk about Earl Warren, a very famous California governor who will later go on to be the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. And then we'll talk about the post-war period in California and some of the things that are taking place there. So let's go ahead and get started. So as I mentioned, of course, California with its proximity to the Pacific is going to be impacted a little bit more probably than some of the more insular states in the United States. Um, California had a lot of military bases, for example, that they needed to protect. They had a lot of industry that they needed to protect. So because of that, there were very common um, air raid drills. And what you're seeing here in this image is a duck and cover drill, which was something that was uh, commonly done at schools for school children to uh, prepare themselves either for a bombing raid or, you know, any kind of attack. And um, this actually will continue on after the wartime period. By the time it got to the 1980s and 70s, when I was going to school, we would still have the duck and cover drills but they kind of turned it into more earthquake drills. I think they didn't want to alarm us and make us think that we were about to be attacked. But, you know, you did um, watch that video about how a Japanese submarine did actually um, attack um, the coast of California. So um, people were actually very much on edge and people believed that this was a real threat, that there could be an attack on California soil. So here are some public service posters that are educating people about what to do during an air raid drill. So you would have these massive blackouts of cities and people that in the air raid sirens would go off, the searchlights would come on, and people were expected to shelter in place. Um, and for people that lived through this, this was uh, it, this is something that they never forgot. You know, even people that were children during this time, this really made an imprint on people's uh, psyches moving forward. So these nightly blackouts in certain areas, particularly in large cities like uh, the San Francisco Bay Area or Los Angeles, um, the air raid sirens. People were very scared um, during this time period because, like I said, the reality of being attacked was never far away. So the other thing that was happening were these scrap metal drives that were popular all over the country. So people really, in many ways, believed in this war. Um, you know, obviously the allies are fighting fascists and in, um, in the Pacific they're fighting Japanese expansion and, um, and imperialism and so 
that, you know, there was a lot of reason to rally behind World War II, and people really did rally behind this war in much greater ways than they even did for World War I. And so people wanted to contribute, and not everybody, of course, could go and volunteer for the military. So what was very popular for the young people to do was to hold these uh, scrap metal drives and this was a way that children could contribute to the war effort and people would gather up whatever scrap metal they had laying around um, and you know the the government would come and pick it up and then it would be melted down and uh, recycled so this was very important because of course a lot of the uh, metal was being used to build planes and ships and war uh, machines. And so the you know industries needed metal to continue operation. And so this scrap metal really helped pull them through. Um, you'll notice here on this sign that is being held up by these kids as they're um, having this uh, scrap metal drive um, is a very sort of racist, again, depiction of Japanese people. And you can get how that Japanese, anti-Japanese sentiment was ve really very strong um, by simply looking at that sign and um, the implications, right, is that, you know, scrap the, slap the jab right off the map with our scrap. Um, so here you have sort of this combination of patriotism and support for the war, but also this underlying racism as well. So one of the uh, ways in which women uh, could contribute to the war effort and were encouraged to do so was by planting victory gardens. And you'll notice here, this is an image of a victory garden. It's very large, it's a neighborhood garden. So this was something that was organized by the neighborhood. And these gardens would pop up everywhere so that people would not have to go to the grocery store to buy their produce and so that produce and other types of food could be uh, utilized and distributed amongst the troops and the allies um, either in the Pacific or overseas and you know these wartime cookbooks were distributed um, it was a way to uh, ration food, save food, have very simple recipes so that you don't need a whole lot of ingredients or uh, special spices. You know, you could just kind of have these very simple recipes, but you could still feed a family. So the idea was conservation, um, and it was seen as being patriotic to, um, uh, to participate in these types of programs like the planting of Victory Gardens. So again, back to this idea of rationing, here you see there is a ration book. You can see on the, the right-hand side in the upper right-hand corner, that's an actual um, cover of a ration book. And basically what it was is you would get um, these tickets that allowed you to have a certain amount of meat or dairy product per week um, and then once you had gotten that and used your ration ticket then you couldn't get any more until the following week so you can see here it sort of uh, breaks it down for you on the left hand side women um, men women and children over 12 years old would be allowed uh, two and a half pounds of meat per week children six to twelve one and a half pounds per week and children six years old and under uh, three quarters of a pound per week so you know meat especially back then it was kind of seen as a necessity um, and so um, this was a big deal for a lot of people to have to ration the amount of meat that they ate um, and then you can see that poster in the middle um, do with less so they'll have enough Again, this promotion of being selfless, of giving yourself up to the war effort. And this was extremely strong through, throughout the country uh, during World War II. Like I said, this, this war was, um, had very little opposition compared to World War I, where you actually had protests against the war during World War I. Um, that was very rare during World War II.
So wartime propaganda posters were very common on the landscape. These were the types of posters that you might see put up in public schools, um, in libraries, in city halls, in DMVs, you know, anywhere where there was a public space. And the idea is, you know, first off, you want to make sure that you are not um, giving information to enemies. So there is this sort of real culture of, you know, sort of fear that there could be spies, um, that you might have neighbors that might um, be sympathetic to the enemy. So you want to make sure that you're not falling um, into enemy propaganda. Um, they wanted to make sure that you weren't being somehow manipulated by you know, Japanese propaganda or Nazi propaganda. Uh, and then the other thing is, as you can see on the right hand side, this particular poster is promoting speaking English and they call it American in this particular poster. Um, but again, this idea that if you were caught speaking a language other than English, that somehow you might, you know, maybe be a traitor to your country. So again, this, you're starting to see the seeds be planted for the post-war era of the Red Scare and the fear of communism and also this culture of conformity that we are really going to see throughout the United States after World War II. Okay, so here in California, entertainment, big business with movies and nightclubs and music, and it becomes very popular in California, particularly because um, you've got all of these military bases and you've got a lot of service people that are going on leave. And we talked about that when we talked about um, the Zoot Suit riots, that that actually caused some tension in Los Angeles. But because of that, you see these entertainment centers popping up all over in major cities throughout the state. Nightclubs and dance halls, servicemen's clubs, movie houses, these all become very popular places for young people to congregate. You've got musicians coming through Cal uh, California like Count Basie, Tommy Dorsey, Glenn Miller, the Andrews sisters. This is the time in which Frank Sinatra and Bing Crosby were out entertaining but also making movies um, and that becomes very important. Um, in Bakersfield, you've got the Oki culture, the you know Southern Plains culture that's um, bringing the Okies had brought hillbilly music and all things Western to California and Bakersfield becomes a hub of music and uh, music studios. It, it becomes known as the Nashville of the West. Um, and then you've got the movies, right? And the movies in many ways were kind of taken over by the government during this time. Um, there was an office called the Office of Wartime Information, and they really encouraged movies to be uh, patriarch, uh, patri um, patriotic. Um, they were to depict America as racially harmonious, a society that is full of patriotism to defeat the enemy. Um, and so they would often inspect films in order to make sure that they were um, patriotic or up to, up to wartime standards. By 1943, every Hollywood studio except for Paramount allowed OWI um, to inspect their films. And they couldn't actually um, tell you that you couldn't run a film but it could it was all about pressure right whether or not you would be supported by the office of wartime information and there was also some uh, financial incentives as well um, for studios that would focus on making uh, patriotic films so there was a lot of um, propaganda that was spread through the owi um, things like films of course then you had the Voice of America, which was a radio broadcast that tried to promote uh, patriotism, uh, both in the United States, but also abroad to 
the service people that were stationed abroad. Um, you also had documentaries that were produced by the Office of Wartime Information. These documentaries would sometimes depict Japanese internment camps as almost like country clubs, you know, and um, so people wouldn't have to feel a sense of guilt for having interned over 100,000 people of Japanese uh, ancestry. Um, there were a lot of photos that were taken by the Office of Wartime Information that was meant to depict um, patri uh, really sort of uplift and uh, depict patriotism as being the ideal. Um, and then, of course, you also had newsreels, and this was the way in which people got their information. Um, newsreels were oftentimes played in movie houses. So right before a movie would go on, you would see a newsreel. And these were heavily censored um, pieces, crafted, crafted pieces of information to depict um, the United States as moving forward in the war effort. Um, and it really did, in many ways, sanitize um, the wartime experience, right? Um, the whole idea being that the United States was going abroad to fight this war um, against fascism, against militarism, against imperialism. So um, again, it, it was a very much, it was a crafted image. Um, it was similar to the Committee of Public Information that was, um, that was about during World War I, but this is basically the, the same thing, but for World War II, the Office of Wartime Information. And it did have a major impact in California because California was seen as a center of uh, dissemination of information for the rest of the nation, particularly in the movie industry. All right, so here you see some images, and these are all from California dance halls. And uh, you'll notice that people, even though it's wartime, people are still having a good time. Um, swing music, um, bebop music became very popular. Uh, during uh, the 1940s. You'll also notice that these dance halls were for the most part racially integrated, um, particularly here in California and particularly in Southern California. And that's a really important point um, to emphasize because um, California, of course, as we know, um, as we've learned throughout this course, is an extremely diverse place. And it's important to realize that that is so much a part of our culture. And um, as we get into the mid 20th century, as we are in this course, you start to see um, that diversity really be celebrated amongst the young people. Okay, so um, here is just some, um, you'll, you'll see here a uh, couple of images of Bing Crosby and Bob Hope, um, who uh, also becomes very popular during this time period as an entertainer and an actor. And um, you, if you click on, so the, the whole idea, they made a series of movies called The Road to blah, blah, blah. Um, and so they, they traveled all, all over the world in these movies to these various places. And these were musicals and they were meant to be very lighthearted. They weren't meant to really be um, invoke any kind of emotion or deep thought or anything. It was just pure sort of fluff entertainment. And that really was the focus of the wartime entertainment industry was this fluff style entertainment. So if you click on the link here, you can see a little clip from uh, The Road to Morocco, which was one of these movies that Bob Hope and Bing Crosby made together during wartime. Um, the, the slide before this also had a link, and that link was um, to show some of the swing dancing that was very popular um, in the 1940s. So if you're interested in kind of seeing some 1940s popular culture, I encourage you to click on these links. Music, of course, very popular. Uh, music had been 
something that had been bringing really the nation together, particularly the younger generation since the 1920s, um, since the you know jazz era. And now as we get into the 1940s, we're getting into the big band era. You'll see there um, Glenn Miller on the left-hand side and Count Basie, a very popular, a couple of the two, two most popular musicians of the time. They both had their own uh, big bands. Glenn Miller actually very tragically died during World War II. Um, he was taking a plane from England over to France to entertain some of the troops, and his plane uh, went missing over the English Channel. He had let, taken off in a in a storm, bad weather, and um, the plane went down. So Glenn Miller was actually a casualty of uh, World War II, and um, and so that was a big deal when when he died. But again, mu music is very um, important during this time period, particularly for uh, the young people. Okay, so during World War II, California will get one of its most popular governors, um, a man by the name of Earl Warren, who you see pictured there. Um, he was a Republican, but he certainly had a progressive bent to him. He believed that um, he believed in the ideas of the New Deal. He thought that people should have a social safety net. Um, and so one of the things that he did when he became governor was created a rainy day fund for um, unemployed defense workers because he recognized that California had this huge population of defense workers that were probably going to be, some of them anyway, be laid off after the war. So he's famous for having thought ahead in that way. He also is responsible for upgrading the state's infrastructure, which helped put some people to work after the war, which was really important. Um, new health facilities were built um, under uh, the Warren administration, as were some welfare benefits were expanded um, in California during the Warren administration, including state medical coverage, um, which is Medi-Cal. Um, that was originally blocked by the American Medical Association of California, but um, eventually, of course, Medi-Cal will become a big part of the state's um, social uh, security network. Um, he was not as good as he should have been in supporting civil rights um, while he was governor of the state of California. California during this time period was still experiencing segregation in um, some of their schools. Um, they were still experiencing a lot of discrimination when it came to housing and jobs. Um, and so Earl Warren was very sort of silent on those issues as governor of the state. But when he becomes the chief justice of the Supreme Court, um, he will be one of the biggest advocates for the advancements of civil rights, and he will be uh, the leading justice writing the opinion on Brown versus the board, which is the famous uh, uh, civil rights case, that landmark Supreme Court case that leads to the desegregation of public schools nationwide. Okay, so California was very much transformed by World War II in a number of ways. First off, and in a huge way, the demographic shift that happens in the state during the war. You've got people coming in to California from all over the country to work in wartime jobs, and when they come at it for the war, most of them don't leave. So the population of California is going to increase and it will surpass New York as being the most populous state in the nation, which we still are today. The other thing that's happening, of course, is an increase in the wartime industries, particularly in the uh, aircraft industry in Southern California, which will lead to 
the aerospace industry, which will become big also in California. This will also lead to the advancement of computer um, and computer um, networks and things like that as we see advancing into the Silicon Valley era in uh, Northern California in particular. So with all of these technologies and advancements, now um, this is because after World War II, you are going to start to see the beginning of the Cold War. And during the Cold War era, that's where the United States and the Soviet Union are going to compete for advancements in technological advancements, but also in advancements militarily. So a lot of that research, a lot of that technology, a lot of that brain power is coming out of California and from California research institutions. So California really becomes um, a leading state after World War I, uh, and arguably it had already um, sort of started to become that partly because of the fact that um, it was the home to the movie industry and movies being one of the most popular forms of entertainment. So California will continue that tradition after World War II as being the hub of the movie making industry. All right, so um, in order to accommodate this growing population in California in the post-war years, you're gonna see what is often referred to as suburban sprawl. This is basically when people leave the city into the surrounding areas to make these areas their homes, their residence, and then they commute to where their jobs are. And so you're gonna see a massive construction boom in order to accommodate people. Um, this typically was happening around the major cities. So you see around uh, San Francisco, uh, Los Angeles, San Diego, this is when you're going to see this type of thing taking place. You have these um, uh, building uh, builders that are coming in and they are laying down housing tracks, often referred to as tracks, track homes. Um, and this is all being built over former orchards, fruit orchards and open fields. And so this is also going to have an impact on the environment of the state. It's going to have an impact on the water infrastructure of the state of, as the population grows. Now, a lot of this is being aided by the GI Bill, which was a bill that was passed by Congress in 1944, that basically allows for veterans coming to, um, veterans coming out of the war, as long as you had served for several months and been honorably discharged, you were eligible for the GI Bill, which allowed you to get low interest mortgages. It also allowed you to go to school for free. So a lot of people were taking advantage of the GI Bill and, and buying homes. And, um, and so you've got this era of relative prosperity after the war. Um, but in, there were also some problems, right? There were, there were things called housing covenants, and this was particular, po particularly popular in areas of Southern California where these housing developers would have these clauses put onto the titles of the home that would say that this home cannot be sold to a person of color. In some cases, it would say this home cannot be sold to a Jewish person. Um, and so you get these communities that are all white and very closed. Um, and at the time, this was not illegal. Um, later on, it becomes illegal and it becomes a major issue in our state, this issue of housing covenants. But um, at the time in this immediate post-war era, um, although people were aware that this was happening, this was not yet a huge um, uh, political issue. You also have um, a, the era of unionization in California. The AFL-CIO will join together in 1955, making the largest uni unionized workforce in U.S. history and the most prosperous middle class. So this allows then for people to really have um, these single family homes, typically with one person 
um, being the breadwinner, one person going out and working, and then you have this baby boom where a lot of kids are being born and the mother is staying at home and taking care of the kids. And you get this sort of stereotypical 1950s family with the single home and the mom and the dad and the two kids, you know, and the dog or whatever, maybe a cat too. Um, so that's all part of this as well. Okay, so here you have an aerial view of a housing development, unmistakable sort of grid streets laid out there, um, and, uh, you know, they, they would be advertised and, you know, very much encouraged for people to come. The other thing about this is it does create a sense of isolation because there is, um, you know, a lot of displacement from uh, extended family during the war. A lot of people had moved from the East Coast, had moved from the Midwest to California for the wartime jobs, and now they're their own. They're out here on their own, and so they're having to create their own communities and their own sense of community. Okay, so now we're going to turn to talking about uh, what was called American schools um, in California. So after Plessy v. Ferguson, which was a Supreme Court case that was handed down in 1896, um, segregation in the United States be, um, became technically legal so that you could technically legally have separate public facilities. And this becomes true for Mexican children, particularly in Southern California, in the form of American schools. So American schools existed under the guise of taking children of Mexican immigrants and putting them into what they called American schools in order to try to acculturate them into American lifestyle teach them English, etc. And um, the idea was, again, to acculturate, but it was actually a very sort of veiled way of discriminating and segregating. And this becomes very apparent in a California Supreme Court case, Mendez versus Westminster. Now, I uh, gave you an assignment that talks in much greater detail about this particular case, um, but I will just give you a brief overview of this case before moving forward. So in the fall of 1944, uh, a woman by the name of Soledad Vidayuri um, took her children and her brother's children to enroll in the Westminster School. Two of the children that she brought with her that day were okay to enter because they were whiter looking children. Three of them, her brother's children, were denied entry into the school and they were told that they had to go to the Mexican school. So clearly this is a case of discrimination, right? Here you have two sets of kids, they're related, they're cousins, right? But because one set of siblings looked whiter than the other, they were allowed into the school. So clear case of discrimination. And so what happens is when Soledad goes home and tells her husband about this, he decides that he is going to sue the Westminster School District. And um, this will ultimately go all the way up to the Ninth Circuit of the California Supreme Court in 1947. And the California Supreme Court will rule that American schools are unconstitutional. Um, and the reason that it um, argues that the American schools are unconstitutional is that segregation, they said that segregation was not racially based, but that it had been implemented by the school districts without being specifically authorized by state law. And so it was, it, it was impermissible, irrespective of Plessy v. Ferguson. So this is how 
California was able to get around Plessy v. Ferguson without having to challenge Plessy v. Ferguson. So, so because Plessy v. Ferguson, again, 1896 Supreme Court case, um, is technically the law of the land because it is the Supreme Court, the way that the Ninth Circuit was able to um, circumvent that was simply by saying that um, segregated schools were not condoned explicitly by California state law and therefore were illegal in California. So interestingly, California becomes the first state um, to explicitly desegregate public schools under Mendez versus Westminster. So in that way, it becomes like a foundational case moving forward for Brown versus the Board of Education, which will be ruled on in 1954, which will desegregate public schools nationally. And that was ruled on by the US Supreme Court. But keep in mind, Mendez versus Westminster is extremely important because not only does it desegregate public schools in California, it sets a legal precedent for Brown versus the board, which is a federal um, case in the 1950s. So California is really sort of becoming, um, at this point, a leader in the movement for desegregation. Okay, so education generally um, during this time period was also booming during uh, the post-war era. And a lot of that had to do with the fact that the population was booming, right? So you have these uh, veterans, they're coming home, they're starting families and people are having children. And so there's this big generation called the baby boom generation and they all need places to go to school and get an education. And California had grown quite an infrastructure, an impressive infrastructure of a public education system, but they needed to build more schools to accommodate um, the growing population of kids. So you start to see a big um, construction boom, particularly in elementary and high schools. Uh, you start to see a change in the education uh, requirements for teachers. Um, instead of just having a teacher training, um, teachers would also have to have an academic degree along with their teaching credential um, in order to teach secondary education. Um, eventually, this is going to lead to the California Master Plan. Um, this is something that is not actually implemented until the, 19, the 1960, um, but it is very important moving forward. According to the plan, um, the top one-eighth or 12.5% of graduating high school seniors would be guaranteed a place at the campus of the University of California tuition-free tuition free, let me say that again, tuition free at a UC if you were in the top one eighth of your graduating high school senior class. The top one third would be able to enter the Cal State system again for free. Um, and then community colleges would accept any student capable of benefiting from instruction. And California Community College were, were meant to basically um, be an open institution. So not only were California Community Colleges going to be there for students that wanted to move on to the university, but it was also there for adult education and adult learners. So the California Community System was actually created during the California uh, Master Plan. So, and then the systems were um, broken down even further for specific um, types of degrees. So the UC system for research and doctoral degrees, the Cal State system for liberal arts degrees and master's degrees with an emphasis on teaching, 
um, and then the junior college, which is what they used to call the community college system, was to prepare students for a transfer to the Cal State or UC or for vocational training. But keep in mind, um, these all of this three-tiered system was originally created to be free for all California residents. So it was a very progressive um, education system that we had here um, in California under the California Master Plan. All right, so California's environment with all of the changes that take place after World War II, it becomes the most populous state in the nation. Um, there's pressure being put on the energy and water resources. The air quality is beginning to decline. And because of all of that, and because there was such um, an outcry against the um, environmental degradation that was happening throughout the state, California really becomes a leader in the environmental movement. Um, and it begins in the Bay Area, actually, with a Save the Bay movement, where a group of uh, women activists actually come together to try to um, restore the wetlands and the things that were being destroyed along the shoreline of uh, the San Francisco Bay. But it, it quickly spreads to other parts of uh, the state and, of course, across the country as well. The environmental movement as a movement really does begin in the 1960s, and it begins as a different type of environmental movement. There had been conservation efforts before this, um, conservation of uh, natural lands with you know, the national parks, also conservation of the redwoods, for example. But the environmental, the modern environmental movement um, wanted a different form of conservation. They wanted one that was a demand for clean, safe, and beautiful environments, a demand for a better quality of life. Um, and this kind of grows out of that post-World War II affluence where you have people really wanting to have spaces to recreate um, that are beautiful, that are pristine. Um, there was an increase in recreational opportunities because again, with that post-war affluence, you have people that are going and um, camping and taking vacations and they're wanting to see a clean environment um, when they do that. You're also going to see, um, and you can see the concern about the environment through the Sierra Club membership, which actually increases tremendously. So Sierra Club membership founded by John Muir back when John Muir was fighting the damming of the Hedge Hedge Valley. In 1960, the Sierra Club had 123,000 members. By 1970, it will have 819,000 members. So just in a decade, um, their membership increased substantially. You also see it on a federal level um, with the passage of the Clean Air Acts of 1963 and 1967 the Water Quality Act of 1965, the Wilderness Act of 1964, um, and all of this really is it, it's beginning in California because California has in many ways been on the cutting edges of movements, um, well, since it became a state. Um, and so this is just another example of that and particularly as i said in the san francisco bay area in los angeles around major cities where you have these environmental concerns um, because of urban growth and suburban sprawl So also contributing to this is a very popular book at the time, a book by the name of Silent Spring, written by Rachel Carson in 1962. It spent 31 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. And this book was particularly influential in California because her book, 
was targeting the use of pesticides um, in agriculture and the effects that pesticides and the chemical waste that comes from the use of pesticides has on birds. And she was particularly targeting in her book the use of DDT. And eventually this book will lead to the banning of DDT. Um, the, 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 the title of the book, Silent Spring, is very specific to this idea that, you know, one day you wake up on a beautiful spring day and you go outside and you don't hear any birds chirping because they're all gone. They're all dead. Um, what would that be like? Right. Um, and so this becomes and it has become really the symbol of the beginning of the modern environmental movement. Um, really waking people up to thinking about the environment in a different way. And again, moving from this idea of the conservation movement being about wise and efficient use of natural resources to really being about a demand for clean and safe and beautiful environments. Okay, so now we're going to shift gears substantially and talk here about the Red Scare um, in this post-World War II environment that we are talking about in the late 1940s and 1950s. So after World War II, um, the United States and the Soviet Union descend into what is called the Cold War. And this war is this um, tension, uh, political tension, economic tension, and military buildup between the United States and the Soviet Union. And what's driving this really is this idea of containment, the containment policy that the United States was now responsible for containing the spread of communism. And so the U.S. puts in place a bunch of mechanisms to try to stop the spread of communism here in the United States. And one of the institutions that was created to do that and investigate possible spreading of communism was the House on Un-American Activities Committee, um, form, formed specifically to investigate suspected communists. And this does have a strong influence in California because in California, you have Hollywood. And the government was particularly um, uh, suspicious of the motivations of Hollywood producers, directors, and screenwriters. And in 1947, a group of just that, of producers, directors, and screenwriters known as the Hollywood Ten um, were brought to Washington, D.C., to testify under the house, um, in front of the House on Un-American Activities Committee. They all refused to testify um, and they were sent to jail. Um, some of them were given a fine. They were all um, charged with contempt of Congress. A lot of this was, and eventually they, many of them will be blacklisted, meaning that they will no longer be able to uh, work in the industry. Ronald Reagan um, was uh, uh, the president of the Screen Actors Guild, and he totally supported this witch hunt, um, basically, against his uh, fellow actors. And um, he encouraged the government to investigate certain circles in Hollywood, and, and he himself was um, very virulently um, anti-communist. And that's sort of how he began his political career was through this um, idea of anti-communism. In fact, a lot of people were able to um, bolster their political careers based on this fear of communism, also sometimes referred to as McCarthyism because um, the term McCarthyism is, is based on a, a man, a senator from Wisconsin by the name of Joseph McCarthy, who went about trying to um, investigate members of the government for being suspected communists. The other thing about this is the loyalty oaths and the loyalty programs that were put in place uh, during this time period. And this was true for um, educators 
who were uh, being expected to um, say an oath of allegiance to the U.S. Constitution before they would be able to um, teach and before they would be able to get hired. So these were, uh, uh, you know, very dark times for a lot of people. A lot of people were accused of being uh, communist or communist sympathizers during this time. And a lot of people were, uh, were blacklisted and lost their um, livelihoods because of the, um, uh, because of this anti-communist uh, crusade. So, um, so you've got um, the regents of the University of California who adopted a loyalty oath in the early 1949. Um, the regents of the University of California oath required university personnel to swear that they were not communists and did not support any party or organization that believes in, advocates, or teaches the overthrow of the United States government. Um, in August of 1950, 32 professors, excuse me, who refused uh, to sign the oath were terminated for insubordination. Um, there were lots of scholars that were actually fired as a result of refusing to say these oaths. So this is the type of way in which um, these loyalty oaths, loyalty programs were impacting people's lives. Okay, so here you see an image of the Hollywood 10 over there on the left. And then on the right-hand side, you see a group of actors um, led by Humphrey Bogart there, um, also in Washington, D.C., there to support um, the Hollywood 10, who again refused to testify in front of the House on Un-American Activities Committee and were later on held in contempt of Congress and fined and jailed, and some of them losing their jobs for the rest of their lives. And there you see a picture of Senator Joseph McCarthy as he presents his communist um, conspiracy to anybody who would listen to him. So here you see some Red Scare posters. Um, again, this was not just something that was happening in California, but certainly something that was happening around the nation. Uh, California, however, was in many ways seen as the hub of the dissemination of information, particularly when it came to movies. So you'll see there in the lower right-hand corner the, the movie The Red Menace. And again, um, this is promoting this idea that, you know, you should be scared of communism, you should be aware that communists could live amongst us. Um, all of these things were contributing to this anti-communist hysteria in the late 40s and 1950s. Okay, so as we get into the 1960s, which will be what our next section is about next week, um, we are going to see another wave of progressive politics in California with the governorship of Edmund Brown. This was actually, this is actually Jerry Brown's uh, father, Jerry Brown, who was just governor of our state and also governor of our state back in the 1970s. Um, he will be California governor from 1959 to 1967. And during that time, he will have a democratic majority in the state legislature, which allows him to pass a lot of legislation. One of the first things that he does is he eliminates the cross-filing system. This is where a candidate can run for multiple political parties during the primary. And um, this allows for uh, candidates to kind of monopolize or corner or eliminate competition um, in the primary process. And this was something that actually Earl Warren had done. And um, so Edmund Brown was very much opposed to this, and um, he eliminates this once and for all 
uh, within Cal the state of California, which is very important because California has direct primaries. He also will be responsible for overseeing California's educational master plan, which we already talked about. This is that three-tiered system, UC, Cal State, Community College. Um, continues to strengthen social programs, um, and he will be um, also overseeing a, an expansion of the uh, uh, California water plan, which we will actually look at a, uh, a map of in a minute. He creates the Division of Fair Employment Practices. Uh, this is very important in order to eliminate uh, discrimination in the workplace. And again, these are all um, programs that are on the state level, so they're much more manageable and these agencies can go out and ensure that there is no discrimination in um, employment practices. And then finally, the Rumford Act, um, which was uh, passed in 1960. Three, um, repealed in 1964 and then uh, reinstated by the California Supreme Court in 1966. This was a very controversial act, the Rumford Act. Um, it was an act to ban discrimination in housing. So remember how I said the housing covenants were very common in California? Um, it faced major opposition and was chipped away to basically only apply to multi-unit housing. Um, and so uh, the Rumf Rumford Act, which was again to ban discrimination in housing, was trying to ban housing covenants, will get whittled down to just being, um, you cannot discriminate within a multi-unit housing complex. Um, it will not be until the United States Congress passes the National Housing Act of 1968 where housing covenants will be eliminated for good. But the Brown administration back in the early 1960s did try to, um, you know, uh, support um, anti-discrimination laws in housing. So Edmund Brown was a huge um, uh, governor, governor, gubernatory a figure in the state. Um, he definitely had a liberal social agenda. Um, he puts a lot of money into the state water project, $1.7 million for the California State Water Project during the time he was governor. Um, he also instates an office of consumer affairs. He also creates an air quality control board. Um, during the time that he was governor, 11 universities were constructed in the state. 1,000 miles of freeway was laid in the state. Um, the state park system um, was, was created and, and uh, reinforced to open up state parks throughout, um, throughout the state as well. So this was a huge um, time period in California history and again sort of the second wave of progressive politics within the state. So here we go. Um, here is a map of the California Water Project. Again this kind of gives you an overview of everything that we have here in the state when it comes to water management and water movement. Um, so let's begin with the Los Angeles Aqueduct, which we did talk about already. The Los Angeles Aqueduct coming here from the Owens Valley into Los Angeles, um, bringing water to Southern California. Then you have the Hetch Hetchy Aqueduct, which we also talked about, the damming of the Hetch Hetchy Valley and the aqueduct, which brings water to the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, you have another aqueduct here, uh, and this aqueduct bringing water also to San Francisco. And then you've got this big aqueduct system in the Central Valley, um, the Friant Kern 
um, canal and the California aqueduct. And these are the big canal systems that you see when you drive through the Central Valley of the state. This is uh, for irrigation purposes, but also to move water from Northern California to Southern California. So the movement of the water is going south here because it needs to feed the Southland. Um, and then you have here the California, uh, or the, excuse me, the Colorado River Aqueduct, again, coming across um, the Coachella Valley. You don't see it because it's underground, um, but this carries water also to the Los Angeles region. And then you have the All-American Canal and other canals in this area in the Imperial Valley, um, also supplying agriculture um, and other canals that now move, go out to San Diego. But overall, you, you get that the primary purpose of the California Water Project is to supply the Southland with water. Uh, because this, this area up here gets lots of rainfall during the winter. Um, this area, of course, is all uh, Sierra Nevada, so this gets a lot of snowfall, and a lot of that water comes off in those mountain ranges and then is controlled and diverted into these other regions. So that's it for now. We will get into Chapter 12 and 13 next week. Have a great weekend, and I'll see you later.